right, guys. Brought you guys a multifamily investor this time. Um, it came from great recommendations from a buddy of mine, Chad, out of Denver. And uh, William here uh, is doing big things in multifamily, so I'm eager to jump right on and, and hear what he's doing and, and how he's doing it. So, um, William, you're out of Nashville. Give us an intro, and uh, we'll dig into your story a little bit. All right. Yeah, Brandon, thanks for having me on. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you inviting me on to your podcast. I, uh, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, born and raised there. I uh, grew up in uh, Tennessee football, love, uh, love some good Tennessee sports, but I started out in the accounting and finance world, got involved in multifamily real estate in 2014, really went all in during that time. But right now I'm working for a private equity group that I help uh, help grow and uh, now a partner and we're based out of Atlanta, Georgia. I live in Nashville, Tennessee and we cover multiple states across the, the southeast. We're buying value add multifamily properties. Uh, we're a vertically integrated company from management to construction to the acquisitions but really my life uh, in the last five years has really been dedicated to uh, to pursuing that path. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So you said you were in finance before and now you've merged into, into this company here. Um, what, what made you uh, make that change? Yeah, sure. So uh, I started working from a really early age. My dad was a, a business owner. He put me to work cutting grass and washing cars when I was about 12 in the summers. I remember I wanted a little basketball goal uh, to, to shoot around in, in the driveway. It was like 80 bucks. He's like, I'll give you a job. I'm not going to buy it, but I'll give you a job. So that was kind of the very beginning of my, my working career. I got a lot of uh, hands-on labor experience. And I think as I got older, I realized I wanted to do something in business. I wanted to be a business owner or, uh, you know, somehow create passive income and something that I could uh, own, manage and grow myself. So that led me into accounting and finance. And I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do or, or how I wanted to get started, but I knew if I had that foundation, I would be able to apply that to just about any business or industry. So studied accounting in school, got a CPA license, came out of school working for uh, Ernst & Young as an auditor, mm -hmm. quickly realized that uh, that wasn't my speed or pace. Uh, it was a great experience, worked with some great people, but moved into their real estate program. Uh, uh, it was a transactional consulting based program, worked a lot in multifamily valuation, commercial valuation, quality of earnings analysis, due diligence. One of the yeah. first clients I worked on was in America. They had just acquired or were in the process of acquiring post properties. And it at the time created the largest multifamily re in the country by unit count. So I was part of a larger team that was uh, valuing that, that acquisition. It was a great experience, but that's kind of how I got started uh, in accounting and finance, how it led to real estate and uh, my interest in multifamily. And then I really just started getting uh, focused on how can I get the experience I need to, to really do what I want to do in this business. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, I was writing down a question here, but I might as well just go on and ask you now. So how do you think uh, your background in accounting and finance has helped you in uh, your real estate investing space? Yeah, it's, it's helped me a ton. And I, I tell people there's so many different ways to get involved in real estate, you know, whether you're doing commercial or residential or whether you're a financing side or you're on the management side. You know, I think it's just important to, to pick one aspect of the business and, you know, kind of really master it or, you know, get, get very comfortable with it. And for me, that was just the accounting and the finance side. So, yeah. Having that background really an understanding for, for, for how the, the larger groups were putting together deals. And then I joined a networking and, and coaching group early on that kind of gave me insight on how smaller operators were doing it. And it gave me confidence because I saw that, you know, it wasn't that much different between an institutional company buying a property or, you know, say an everyday uh, girl or guy going out and buying a property. Uh, it was really just a matter of zeros and uh, you know, where the, where the equity and the sourcing was coming from, but at the end of the day, very similar process. So I think that having that background, you know, gave me the confidence to go out and understand that this can be put together. I didn't have all the pieces, definitely didn't do it by myself. Uh, but it, it helped a lot, but I think, you know, whether you're in the sales side or, uh, the finance side, or, you know, even if you're an entrepreneur kind of doing all of it, you 
I think you've got to try and focus on on one aspect and then maybe build a team or, or build people around you that can help you with some other other aspects of the business because there's a lot to do. Yeah. The accounting, yeah. you know, looking at the balance sheet, the P&L and underwriting the deals has really uh, has really served me, served me well. Yeah. But just one piece. You, know, you got to you got to know how to. So a lot of times the finance guys, they don't really know how to work on the properties. And the, the guys that work on the properties, they're not necessarily the most financial savvy. But I think, you know, the real bread and butter uh, is in the construction side of the business. And it's very, very difficult to learn. But you got to know, you got to know all aspects of it to really, to really excel. But I think if you're just getting started, you know, pick one area and really uh, master that or, or get comfortable with that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, for me personally, it has helped a lot. Um, hold on. All right, sorry about that, guys. We had a little bit of audio glitch here. So I was talking about how I think the um, me starting from single family. In the county. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for me, the the business side of it has been a little bit of a hurdle. Um, but as far as evaluating properties, it, it, it kind of just came to me uh, pretty seamlessly. But you were saying that the value of um, – uh, knowing the construction side has been pertinent to you. And I think that was a benefit for me getting into it was knowing the rehab of a single family was a somewhat easy transition into the rehab of the, of the multifamily. So, um, Absolutely. I mean, yeah, cause it, knowing the construction side can make or break a deal, um, instantly. hundred percent. And you, know, you yeah, if you uh, if you have no construction background and you're completely relying on contractors or GC to to lead you lead you uh, accurately and efficiently, you know sometimes that can work out. But you really need to know your stuff in, in construction, especially yeah. if you're taking on larger projects. Single family is a great place to to cut your teeth. Yeah, right. So you've been um, with this company um, for. Uh, what do you say, four or five years now? I I left Ernst & Young in 2017. So I, I love the the fearless pursuit of freedom. Uh, it's something near and dear to my heart. But in 2017, I left Ernst & Young to yeah. go out and, uh, and ultimately try and put together deals on my own. I was just tired of the corporate world. I, I felt like I had what I needed to get started. I just got to a breaking point where, you know, I had to try. So I left the company on good terms and in pursuit of starting my own business. Over the next seven or eight months, I, I worked with different investors and entrepreneurs. I helped kind of bird dog single family deals in Chattanooga. I was helping underwrite and be an acquisitions person for uh, uh, for anybody. Really, I was just hustling. And yeah. through those months, those were those were tough months. Uh, I didn't have a lot of savings. I think I left uh, Ernst and Young with with maybe $3,000 in my bank account. I had two rental properties and a place to lay my head at night, but I was, uh, I was scrapping and, you know, I'm one of those people when your back's against the wall, I feel like that's when you perform it at your best. So kind of threw myself into that situation, but through that process, I've met some really, uh, really interesting people and got hooked up with uh, some smaller private equity companies that were buying multifamily. And in 2018, I joined uh, a company called Tudor McLeod. They were uh, had been around about five years in multifamily as an acquisitions director. But over the last uh, year and a half, really six months into that that um, that company, uh, the company kind of transitioned, and one of the partners retired, and that that uh, provided an opportunity for me to to take on more responsibility within the company. And uh, me and my business partner now uh, have formed. Uh, another entity that we're doing acquisitions in, but I, I would say I've been working with uh, the business partner I have now for about two years full time. But I knew her for about four years and uh, was working, you know, really as an employee coming in the door. Uh, wasn't my original goal set it out as when I left the corporate world. But you know, I, I think this is very much a team sport, um, and I, I wouldn't be where I am today without you know the business people and the, the partners around me. Yeah. That's great, man. Um, Coming up on two years. Yeah. All right. So you've been um, with your partner there for about two years now. And audio sounds way better now. So you've been uh, with your partner for about 
two years now and um, give us a little insight of what what kind of or uh, let's people like talking about doors. So how many buildings and doors have you acquired? And then we'll just pick one of them that uh, we'll dig into and analyze from um, finding it, sourcing the deal to uh, evaluating the um, the, the P&Ls, the construction onto um, how your performer looks or is, is it future outlook is going to look. Sure, yeah. Like, so. Brent, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely my face. So business partner and I, we've been on a, a tear since uh, to July of 2018. We have acquired a little over 1,400 units, and that was across nine complexes. We actually have a close today that we're um, going to be heading to the bank in a little bit to establish our, our checking and security deposit accounts for. But we, uh, yeah, we've, we've done 47 million in transactions and in, uh, in acquisitions over the last 13 or so months. Uh, and those are probably from 50 units to the property that we're closing on today of 208 units. Wow. So we're opportunistic in what we're looking for. And we've definitely been very active active over the last 13 months yeah um so you want to talk a little bit about you know maybe the details or that yeah let's of some of the details? let's um I, I assume that uh things have uh changed a little bit since the first deal to the most current of the 200 and uh you say eight doors uh -huh. <clears throat> um so let's talk about uh, one of the smaller ones one of the first ones and and uh how you okay. found it yeah. on that one yeah Okay. I'll, I'll back up just a little bit. You know, the very first uh, deal that I ever did uh, outside of my business partner is a single family deal. I kind of credit that to, to getting me started. It was a, a small single family property. I came out of school and I talked the local bank into giving me a mortgage for that property. I had basically a, a employment letter from EY saying that they were going to start me uh, that summer, but I hadn't technically I didn't, I didn't technically had a job when I, uh, I got the mortgage, but I, I borrowed my Dow payment from, um, from friends and family that mm -hmm. were willing to uh, give me a, basically a short term bridge loan. So, and then I moved three friends in from school to help me pay for, for that deal and yeah. rented out the, the rooms in that house for a four year period, which I'm now getting to renovate and turn it to an Airbnb property, which is exciting. But that really that really set the stage for me and allowed me to kind of bounce back and forth and go to different locations. It was really the, the first deal that, that got me started. A year later, I, I took a HELOC out on that house and I, I purchased my second condo property. It was a little 760 square foot rental condo in Nashville. It does really good from a cash on cash standpoint. But after that property was really when I'm like, okay, this, is, this works, this is good, but it's gonna be very difficult to scale this model and i started focusing on multifamily and uh larger properties so now speeding up in a, <clears throat> another two years or so the first large commercial deal that i sourced and ultimately brought to the table with uh, my business partner now was a 160 unit deal in georgia is quail ridge apartments and i uh, i found that property through a relationship i was uh going to uli the urban land institute and uh, shaking trees, letting people know who I was, what we did, and, and who I was working for. And I, uh, I remember a woman came up to me after the, the end of the event. She said, hey, I have a, a really good friend, and her husband is a, a loan broker um, for a, a mortgage company here in town. You guys should meet. So uh, she introduced me to him, and we probably talked every day for three, four, five-month period. You know, he, he would ask me what I was, what deals I was looking at. I'd I'd share with him. He'd say, "Hey, this is where you know we would be pricing the deal from a, a debt a debt standpoint. This is the terms that we could offer." Uh, it just kind of the relationship evolved from there. But uh, probably five months after I met this guy, um, and a lot of conversations later, he called me up and said, "Hey, I've got a, a deal that the the seller just backed out of, and uh, I want to plug you in with the broker." Then great, send it over. So he, uh, you know, he plugged us in with uh, the broker, and it was uh, an off-market transaction. You know, we we got basically plugged into the deal, but because of this, you know, relationship and and uh, the work that had been developed prior from going to the networking meeting to you know, kind of a serendipitous meeting um, with the broker, 
you know, you just never know, never know how you're going to source these deals. But I think uh, having a shotgun approach and, and being consistent and showing up is ultimately how you, how you find them. But that was the first larger deal that, that uh, I was a part of. Uh, my business partner, Maureen Miles, did a huge component of that and wouldn't have been able to take that deal down without her. She, uh, she had the experience and, and the track record and was able to raise the funds for the deal. But uh, you know, working with the right people and um, and bringing those different components uh, was the very first one that I, we had done together, and that was actually the first deal that she did um, in the new entity that we we formed and have created. So it was uh, it was a big big deal for both of us, big transition point. It uh, kind of solidified all the hard work that you've put in over or I put in over the last two years. That hey, this is real, this this works, and uh, the law of the first deal took over after that. I think it was. You know, maybe two or three months later, we were under contract for our next one. And, uh, you know, 1,400 units later, um, you know, 1,600 after today, we'll, we'll have closed nine transactions uh, since then and um, have, uh, have really had a great year. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, you said 13 months. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. Since July 2018, Quail Ridge was, was purchased in, uh, I think it was July 11th of 2018. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so we've. We've been working really hard. We, uh, we <laughs> I think we, uh, we make a lot of sacrifices and do things that uh, other people probably don't ordinarily do, but we, uh, we've been getting some deals done this year. Yeah. I mean, a uh, hundred doors a month. It's not too shabby, huh? Yeah. If we can keep <laughs> that, uh, that average up, but we'll, yeah. be, we'll be doing good. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Okay. So, uh, I, I assumed that, uh, your first deal was, uh, the smaller one, the 50 unit, but it was 160 units. Um, so, uh, your network kind of got you hooked up with that one. And 100%. yeah. Um, was that a value add complex? Was it a lot of remodel or did you take it over stable, you know, kind of, uh, let's dig into yeah, like yeah. The, the nitty gritty on that one. Yeah, so we that was I would say a light value add. I think we purchased the the property for right around sixty two a door. It's, it's close to seven point six million dollar purchase price. The uh, the gentleman that we purchased it from had purchased it from the original owner or developer's daughter. So it was a situation where you know the a family member had inherited the property and wasn't you know really in the position to run it, and mm -hmm. we picked it up one removed from them. So. It had been cared for over the years, but obviously it needed some refresher, right? It wasn't uh, one where we've gone in and there's been a significant amount of down units and we're really repositioning and driving a ton of value. But uh, the roofs had just been replaced on this property and, and the paving had been done. So that was a great start. Yeah. But, uh, we're going to put about uh, between the... We'll, be, we'll put between five and 6,000 a door into this property over a 12 to 18 month period. That'll be anything from replacing HVAC units to new LVP flooring, uh, countertops, fixtures, uh, updating the units. It was, it was built in 1986 and it, uh, again, it was in good condition, but uh, we come in and do a tailored value add plan that you would see across most of our properties. We like to enhance amenities. And, uh, and try and create a better sense of community on the property, upgrade the interiors and exteriors, uh, and go through that process. So it was a, it was a really clean deal. Um, wasn't a huge rehab, but we'll, we'll definitely be spending a significant amount of money in the property over the next 12 to 18 months. And that'll be carried out through the, the construction company. Yeah. But didn't require bridge financing. We were able to get a, a long-term uh, Fannie Mae agency debt product. Uh, I think we have a 12 year term. Um, I want to say our interest rate was low fours. I'd have to, to go back and look at it, but uh, it was a really clean deal. Yeah, no, no, it sounds great. Uh, and for a property that only needs five to six grand a door, it's pretty cool. Um, so uh, along with your rehab, I assume you just, uh, as you turn units, you're raising the, the rents a smidge and uh, doing an overall lift on the performa over say a two year period? Yes. Yes. A lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the rent roll had been uh, in the property for over four or five years. A lot of those leases, the, uh, like I said, it was only one removed from the, the original owner. So a lot of times those properties are, uh, they're 
they're taken care of, but the the performance is kind of sleepy, I would say. Yeah. So as we as we upgrade those units, we uh, will get rent increases, and a lot of our efficiencies come from operational uh, efficiencies. We have a management company that manages these properties, and we can run them uh, we can run them lean and mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions. So uh, your new entity manages because uh, I know a lot of these the bigger syndicators will um, you know it's kind of if they want to deal with the management or if they don't want to deal with the management and they keep it in or out of house. But, um, uh, I think that's, in my opinion, I think having it in house would be able to make for a uh, stronger platform, especially when fundraising is that, Hey, we're going to manage this asset ourselves and make sure that it's performing properly. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I can't take a ton of credit for the property management side of the business. That's, that's mostly, uh, my business partner, Mm-hmm. You're hitting that, but it's exactly what you said. It's for the control. It's not a huge profit center, but uh, I think that she had gone through three or four property management companies uh, over the last five years and yeah. really had just grown frustrated with, with dealing with them to the point where let's just build our own, train our own people and, and just have that, that tighter control over the properties. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I just had a thought that, Maybe we jump too deep real quick. Are you syndicating this? We do. We okay. raise uh, we raise all of all of our own money uh, in house. We don't we don't uh, we don't raise from the institutions. Uh, okay. We do syndicate equity with okay. private uh, private individuals. Yeah. Okay. So I I personally know what a syndication is. I've never done one, but I know what it is. But in a quick uh, two minute spiel, what's the difference between paying cash for an apartment and a syndication? Um, cause a lot of people don't understand what a syndication is. Yeah, sure. So a syndication, uh, can be, you know, sometimes an analogy I use is, is taking a flight. Uh, you're basically renting an airplane. A group of people are paying to, to lease space on an airplane to travel from point A to point B. Mm-hmm. And a syndication is, is similar in that way. It's a, a group of people coming together, consolidating resources to, purchase an asset or a share of a company that owns an asset uh, and ultimately with an investment plan, uh, a risk adjusted investment plan and an expectation of, of return um, to some kind of exit period for that syndication. But say in the most basic form, it's just a, a group of people pulling their money together for a common purpose. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. And, in, and in our case, you know, we're, we're pulling money together from private investors to, to purchase real estate uh, fix them up, uh, operate them and, and ultimately sell them, uh, at a, you know, an expected period. Yeah. And, uh, on that note, what is your time frame? Cause I, um, I know a guy named Will Crozier, he was in and out of these things three to five years. And then we have, um, Tim Bratz out of Ohio. He's in them for the long haul. So he'll bring it, he'll syndicate a deal and then refinance out within a couple of years and then keep them for himself for the long term. What's your business plan? Yeah, so we we kind of have a, a, a multifaceted approach. I think we try and cater uh, to our investors. Some of our investors like a more short-term uh, investment opportunity, uh, yeah. two, three, five years, and, and some investors just want that annuity or, or cash flow over a, a ten to twelve-year uh, term. So we try and we try and uh, cater to both. But for example, the the property that we're closing on today is a 208 unit property. It's 80% occupied. So it requires a bridge loan going into the property. It's an unstabilized asset. Um, the reason it's unstabilized is, is mostly operational inefficiency and the owner just being comfortable, uh, yeah. original builder on this project. So we're going to come in and over a, a 24 month period, we'll invest about $2.4 million into this property. Will increase the occupancy, increase collections, and in a 24 month period, we'll either refinance the asset into a, a, a long term uh, note, a long term uh, agency debt product yeah. for in the 12 years, or we might sell it. So that might be a, a situation where we set up the, uh, the investment for a more shorter term, but there's the option to go longer if we need to. We're always trying to have multiple exit strategies. But for a property like Quail Ridge, one of the first properties that, or the first commercial property that I was involved with, 
you know, that, that was a pretty clean property, right? So we're expecting to hold that long term. We have a 12 year note going into that property on it. We may sell it uh, in year five, typically on the longer term uh, investments. We set an expectation of five years. But we let our investors know that it could be a little longer and, you know, it could be a little shorter if we hit our investment uh, projections earlier. So yeah. we, we do both. Yeah, that, no, that's great. That's perfect. Um, it, it's strange to me that somebody would build, you know, I always wonder why people are in a, some sort of a motivated seller situation. But it's strange to me, even in these big assets, a 208 door apartment complex that he built you just let it go. It's, it's such a weird concept for me to wrap my brain around that. I mean, cause it wasn't a cheap build. I mean, the dude spent, you know, three to $6 million in this thing. And then just like, didn't know how to run the books. It's just a weird concept to me, but it's a proof that there's deals everywhere. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. The, uh, you know, yeah, it is. It's, it's, uh, it's surprising that you would see an asset of this this caliber, right? Not not op being operated institutionally, but um, you know, you just have an owner that had a, a fully depreciated asset that was fully paid off, and he was comfortable. Uh, it wasn't his only his only real estate investment, and uh, I'm sure he was making good cash flow from the property. And I think yeah. as you get older and you own more property, you're really just looking for less headaches versus you know really driving the bottom line. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, paid off. I mean, 200 units paid off is a nice uh, cash flow. Yeah, so. <laughs> right, for sure. Yeah. Not many people, I think that's the first person I've met who uh, who built an apartment complex, fully depreciated it, and uh, and still owns it. So it's pretty cool to, to see. I, 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 uh, I'm, I talk to a lot of real estate investors, and a common theme I get from some of them is, I wish I had it never sold. I wish, wish I never yeah. sold. But uh, right. as we know, with uh, equity and debt and the terms of both of those components, uh, selling, selling is necessary. Yeah. Time. Yeah. Understandable. Um, yeah. It's a strange thing. Um, so let's talk about that one and just a smidge longer. But um, that was direct to seller right? or was a broker? Did you have a broker bring it to you or how did you find that one? There was a broker involved in that. So, you know, that's one of the, the main components of our business is developing relationships with brokers and, uh, and just constantly turning over stones, looking at every deal, underwriting every deal and trying to be easy to work with. Yeah. I think a lot of groups out there, you know, they want to, they almost make it confrontational or, or combative and like it's me versus you. So we just try to be easy to work with. We know our numbers going in. Uh, we're confident in our ability to execute and close. And I think we, uh, we have a reputation and a track record to back that up. Yeah. Um, uh, building all those relationships. Um, I'm sure you get a, a ton of deals, um, as I say, across your desk. Do you have a quick and dirty analysis of these things or do you dig into these things, um, hardcore before you even invest and think about going even, even further? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I think that definitely there's a quick and dirty analysis to it, and trying to, as I say, qualify a deal. Yeah, it is a numbers game, and you know, just because the deal's not good for me doesn't mean it might not work for you, uh, and vice versa. So, I definitely try and give it a high level, um, quick and dirty analysis, and then if it meets a certain set of criteria, I'm like, okay, let's really dig into this one. Is it, you know. And then I'll start doing more market research and, and really spending uh, more time on the details. Yeah. But in markets that we're, we're active in, uh, yeah, we, we pretty much know, uh, know a good deal when we see one, I guess you would say. Yeah, I mean, um, doing market research is a real giant pain in the rear, in, in my opinion. So for like you guys, you've chosen two markets. And so if you're within a few miles to 10, 15 miles of your other assets, then a full on market research isn't super necessary. You already know what your two ones are going to rent for. You already know what everything's going to rent based off of its neighborhood. So that's always a, a, a good makes, deal. Makes it a lot easier. Yeah. And you don't want to tie up a ton of time underwriting a deal that, you know, you have no shot of getting because it's, it's priced way too high or, you know, whatever the reason may be. So it's, it's a balance for sure. And, uh, you know, 
it's, it's a numbers game. You got to look at a lot of deals to, to close one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, earlier you had mentioned that, um, and, and not a lot of syndicators think about this, un- unfortunately, but you had mentioned that, uh, when you're remodeling a property, you talk about uh, remodeling the interior, but also the exterior for a community feel. Um, and, and I don't think uh, too many, I, I think it's getting more uh, mainstream now, but uh, to me, uh, when we talk about the community feel, it's the barbecue at the end of the walk, it's a small playground, and it's making it, um, making it a, an asset that people don't want to leave is, is my feel. Is that what uh, you're trying to achieve there? Yeah, I think, it, you know, some, you want, you want people to take pride and be proud of, of their, their home at the end of the day and, and for it to be like a home. Uh, and I think people to feel good about inviting their friends over and, and having their family <laughs> over. So that's just having a clean, safe property and uh, something that's well taken care of, you know, it, uh, it doesn't have to be the most expensive things in the world necessarily, but just uh, you can tell, you can drive around properties and, and see, you know, people just aren't caring for the asset. You don't have somebody, um, you know, keeping up on the landscaping and, and making sure the siding's pressure washed on a yearly basis, upgrading amenities, adding playgrounds for, for kids in the areas. And yeah, very much so those common areas like the the barbecues, that's, a, that's exactly some of the things we look at and, and want to see. It's something that uh, is is rewarding to see. You know, it's just uh, you know people kind of decorating their front porches, putting uh, putting out Halloween decorations or or Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever the the holiday may be, and uh, you know maybe putting out some some plants or sweeping off their stair steps. You just kind of see people taking pride of ownership um, yeah. or, or taking care of where they're living. And uh, when you start to see that, you know you really uh, get a sense of like, get a sense of community, and I think it uh, it helps. It definitely helps. It always takes a few a few bad apples to spoil the bunch. Yeah, I mean, in a, in a, as the operator, I think it's um, in my mind is pure common sense. If you can make it somewhere that people want to live, then you have less retention issues and and ha- you have less vacancy. And uh, I mean, I guess some people would say that you got a tenant staying in there at, at one m- monthly rate um, for five years is probably a bad thing because you can't raise it, but. I think uh, with any business, if you if you don't have to go search for the next prospect, uh, you save a lot of money on on marketing. Uh, mm. And uh, yeah, you nailed it. The, the largest one of the largest expenses is turnover costs. So uh, if if you're not having to turn over units because people are people love the the community and don't want to live anywhere <clears> else, then you're absolutely right. It it does uh, it does decrease your expenses. Yeah. yeah, I think people are willing to pay. You know, people are willing to pay for. Uh, I think they understand that. You know, inflation causes pricing to go up and taking care of properties uh, tends to have pricing go up. It's when owners just raise rents for no reason and there's no value being given back to the tenants is when people are like, hey, you know, this is this is a um, this doesn't <laughs> this doesn't feel good. But yeah. uh, when you come in and you can show them that you care by you know enhancing the community amenities and keeping a clean and safe and dry property and hosting uh, events with the uh, the management and just doing doing little things showing appreciation right showing appreciation resident appreciation it goes a it goes a long way yeah yeah i've heard of a few doing like little barbecues and stuff um um and random get togethers just to have some hot dogs and hamburgers and get the community together yeah right, yeah it's 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 simple stuff but it, it, it makes a difference i think in the bnc space a lot of times it's overlooked so, yeah uh bnc as in the asset class Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you go into a, an A class, you know, urban downtown city with a rooftop pool. You know, they probably have a, you know, a staff that's doing hosting, you know, community events and maybe even somebody in the building that's responsible for that. But in B and C, I think it's it's uncommon and, and it's a big value add uh, for residents. Yeah. Uh, and and on that note, um, I assume, um, especially since you're doing value add, that you are buying in in. B and C class areas. Is that the long-term play there? I, I think so. Yes. That that's uh, the, our core business. That's what we know the best and definitely something I believe that we'll always do. We do have different forces of financing and different partnerships that we would like to, to leverage maybe to go into a space more for 
a fee-based management uh, type of situation, but I think uh, we'll, we'll always be in the B and C space and operating in that space. Yeah. Um, you kind of made it sound like there you were looking for other properties to manage, or did I misread that? I think uh, so. B and C is our our core business, and mm-hmm. and we know well, and that's I think what we like the most. But I'm not saying there's not opportunities in class A and as we grow and mature as a company, we develop relationships uh, with different equity providers, different debt providers that may not be looking for B and C space. They, yeah. they want to buy class A long-term assets, but they need operators to run it. So that's not going to be a traditional investment from where we're used to coming in, uh, repositioning the asset and driving a ton of money into the property. It's more so coming in and just managing it well and managing the asset for uh, management fees versus uh, completely running the asset on our own in the BNC space. Yeah. Yeah. Not like it's a little bit different strategy. You know, some of the you know, typically the syndicators that are, are buying the class A, you know, they're, they're raising institutional equity and they control a very small part portion of the deal. And not that that's better or worse. It's just a, a different strategy than, than some of the B and C acquisitions and syndicators. Yeah. Well, uh, I think it'd be good for um, your core business there in the B and C class. Cause as you, um, uh, as you are around these A class buyers um, more than likely they started in the B and C and for whatever reason they evolved, but that'll give you more opportunity to, um, maybe 1031 into their old properties or they 1031 out of their properties into yours or, you know, whatever. Right. It could be a good, uh, absolutely. Business. Yeah. That's absolutely. awesome. Um, hmm. There's so many questions with multifamily cause it's such a, a, uh, large platform, but somewhat simplistic, but every aspect of it is a really long topic. Um, You're so right about that, yeah, because if you're looking at it from high above, it's kind of like the single family world. You got the, the purchase, the refinance, and um, the the holding and management of it. But then every single aspect is so huge, and it's hard to really dive in in a, in a short um, forty minutes to an hour conversation. Um, so we kind of dug into the one sixty uh, unit one. Um, you said you're going to the bank today for uh, your securities and and account today for your 208 unit um uh, uh at a 30,000 foot view what's uh what's your plan now in long term just a quick uh last minute deal and then we'll we'll kick you out of here but um uh, how's this because yeah, this sure. sounds exciting 200 units is a pretty big deal yeah it's uh i've been working on we've been working on this since uh probably may of 2018. So it's been a long acquisition acquisition process. We've been under contract about 65 wow. days now. So, yeah. um, but it's been a, it's been a long, uh, long sales cycle, I guess you would say. So yeah, 208 units, uh, it's 80% occupied. We're purchasing it for 7.628 million, I believe right around uh, 37 a door. Mm-hmm. We'll, uh, we'll put in 2.4 million and that, that money will be invested over a 12 to 18 month period through our in-house construction company. We have a, a project oh, manager. You got in-house I, too. Yeah. yeah okay. That's absolutely cool. awesome. And he'll, he'll be overseeing all of our, our CapEx needs with that property. So some of the things that we have budgeted in that 2.4 are our roofs. Uh, we'll, we'll be replacing and repairing a lot of the soffits, roofs, and sightings around the building as mm-hmm. needed. We'll be uh, repaving the parking lot. The trash compactor needs some work down there. That's one of the CapEx items. Uh, one of the things that we like to do on properties is replace windows. So this yeah. property has the old aluminum windows. That's a, an easy value add, not only from a, an aesthetic standpoint, but also from an efficiency and, and saving costs for utility. Oh yeah. Uh, and then the inter- interior upgrades. So we uh, we love to do laminate vinyl plank flooring and. Uh, we'll replace the cabinets on this one or the, the cabinet faces, new hardware, uh, countertops and, and fixtures uh, and just increase the occupancy. So yeah. that'll be executed uh, with a bridge loan. We'll be drawing uh, construction draws every, every couple of months as we incur these expenses, the bank will be reimbursing us uh, for those. And 
over a 12 to 24 month period, we're going to be repositioning that asset, driving up collections through increasing occupancy, uh, increasing collections. We'll be able to lower some of our expenses on the, the operating statement because this owner was, uh, was was running a lot of personal expenses to the property and, and things that we can kind of fat that we can trim, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so with the combination of the raise, you know, the raise collections through the, the increased occupancy and lowering some of those expenses, we have about 500 units in, in the market, in the nearby markets. We've got some scale down there. Uh, we'll be able to ultimately increase NOI and on a cap rate, uh, you know, based on a, a capitalization rate, to be able to, to create value. And that will allow us to either refinance the asset or, or sell at a, a premium from what we purchased it for. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Uh, you're doing quite a bit of remodel on that one. I haven't heard of too many people replacing windows, but the interior remodels have been pretty much no brainers for most operators. But um, yeah, like to, to your point, I mean, trimming the fat, uh, the windows is part of trimming the fat, although it's a pretty heavy expense up front. I mean, your energy yeah. costs are going to drop significantly. Um, um, for personal gain, I just bought a smaller complex, 15 units. And so one of my tasks is trimming the fat. Um, uh, for energy, my plan was to, I didn't even think about windows, honestly, but was, uh, all led lighting, um, and yeah. then, um, plumbing fixtures. So my, my faucets and shower heads and toilets were all going to be low flow. Is there any other things Absolutely. you can think about that would, uh, affect that? As far as from a utility efficiency standpoint? Yeah. Just, uh, overall energy and utility, getting those bills down. Yeah, I would think, uh, I think that uh, if you're already not billing back for some of the utilities and you you can, I think that's a great way because people are much more conscious of their usage if they're actually having to pay for it, you know, depending on the market that may or may not be a possibility, but yeah. that would be the first thing I would look at. And then you nailed it on the head, the, the low flow toilets and the low flow fixtures to reduce water savings. I think you want to make sure that um, you do that though, where it's not too much, you know, you have some of those features that it just seems like the water's barely dripping out, but right. that's a great method. And then also the windows, um, you know, putting in the, the double pane, uh, I would definitely do grid. One way we save money on windows is we only do one, uh, we do a fixed portion and then, uh, one operating portion to, to reduce the material cost a little bit, but not only does that seal the the uh, the property better, but it just really upgrades and, and makes it look so much better. If you're if you have an older '70s property and it has the original aluminum windows, you wouldn't believe uh, what a difference it makes to to put in some of those those new windows and really really upgrades the feel of the property. Uh, but those are those are the things that we focus on when we're we're strategizing on utility savings and, and how we can improve the property from that standpoint. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I appreciate it. I don't know why I never about the windows. That was dumb. But, yeah, and I mean, the banks also offer uh, some savings, uh, the green rewards loan programs. You can't get on every property, but uh, and they're tightening it up a little bit with interest rates shrinking. But that uh, that's also something to look at, you know, and ask the the lenders about. Hey, if if I put in low flow or or uh, or new windows, or if I'm able to ultimately decrease electric and water by 20 or 30 percent and they'll give a, a a better rate on the loan something yeah. that's got to be on the front end that's something to be aware of as well yeah no that's awesome i hadn't heard of that it's the first one for me for sure um okay well i've already taken an hour of time i mean this conversation could probably go on for a couple more hours digging into every facet of it but um i appreciate you digging a couple of these properties apart for us i mean um uh, for me, like I said, I started a single family and I'm kind of over it. I hate the transactional process of uh, the flipping game. So that's why I started getting into commercial. Um, so I appreciate all the knowledge that, you, that you've given me. Um, for anybody that wants to uh, talk to you about uh, a deal or money or, or anything, uh, what's the best way they can reach out to you? Yeah, sure. And I just want to say thanks for, for having me on. I really enjoyed it as well. Brandon, um, the best way to get a hold of me would either be through uh, my Instagram. It's uh, handled Will Walker underscore three, the number three, or at our website at www. 
for M R E I.com. Okay. Your emails for my, okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll tag that down below. Okay. Yeah, you can go on the website and, and submit uh submit an online based form. We uh, we're happy to, to try and help and, and talk, uh, talk about our investment strategy and love to talk real estate. I could talk all day about multifamily and real estate. I think uh, single family experience is great. And then, uh, you know, it, it leads into uh, it leads into experience in commercial. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, cool, man. I appreciate it. Um, I always ask everybody the same question at the very end, and it kind of just uh, gets us out of the seriousness. Well, it's also serious in its own aspect. But, anyways, if you had six months to live, what would you do with it? Ooh, if I had six months to live, what would yeah. I do with it? Yeah. yeah. You know, I'd probably be, uh, I'd probably travel a little more, but I'd still be looking for deals. I'd still yeah. be looking for, uh, for multifamily deals. Yeah. I love nah. what I do. So, uh, it's, it's just fun. You know, not every day, uh, there's challenges and hurdles, but ultimately this is a fulfilling business and I don't know if much would change. Maybe, uh, maybe a couple more destinations, but, uh, right. I'd stay on the deal hunt. Awesome. Well, cool. I'll, uh, I'll make sure to tag your contact information down below and people can reach out to you if they're, uh, they're accredited investors and, and get things rolling. Awesome, Brandon. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Enjoy talking with you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. Thank you.